SN1 or SN2? We've learned about both of these type of reactions, but you might be saying, well, when does SN1 occur and when does SN2 occur? Uh, how do I know which one happens? So we're going to go through the things that you consider to determine whether or not the reaction goes by SN1 or SN2. Okay, with an SN2 reaction, you need to have a primary or a secondary carbon. Because of the steric hindrance that would result from a tertiary carbon, we can't have a tertiary carbon undergo SN2. The secondary is slow, but it does go ahead in a reasonable amount of time. But with SN1, the carbon has to be either secondary or tertiary because primary is unstable. And if you force it by heating it, what's going to happen is probably carbocation rearrangement. So uh, we don't really like using primary carbons in SN1 reactions. So what's, uh, th this is like the key thing that we notice first is the carbon. Is it primary, secondary, or tertiary? So we look at the substrate first. But then we can consider the nucleophile, the leaving group, and the solvent. The nucleophile should be good for an SN2 reaction. Uh, it can't be a lousy one. It has to be um, at least mediocre to good. With uh, a, an SN1 reaction, you, the characteristic of the nucleophile doesn't really matter that much, except that it needs to be non-basic. If it is a basic nucleophile, what will happen is another reaction we're going to learn about shortly. Um, so it can be a poor nucleophile as long as it's non-basic. The leaving group in an SN2 reaction has to be at least okay. Uh, you can't be lousy. Okay, if you have a lousy one, it's just not going to go ahead. But something like chloride isn't the best leaving group, but it's good enough for an SN2. Uh, the uh, For an SN1 reaction, you better have a good leaving group. Chloride will work, but it'll be kind of slow. Bromide would be a lot better, or even water as a leaving group is even better. Uh, with the solvent for a, uh, an SN2 reaction, we have to have an aprotic solvent. We have to have a polar aprotic solvent. And with SN1, we need to have a polar protic solvent. So when we go to look at reaction conditions, the first thing we do is we must consider the carbon. Is the substrate primary or secondary or tertiary or secondary? If it's primary, we know it's going to have to go SN2. If it's tertiary, we know it has to go SN1. The real question is when it's secondary. If, the, what, if it's secondary, then you start looking at these other things. You look at the solvent to see, is it polar aprotic? Well, probably SN2 is going to occur. Or is it polar protic? Well, then probably SN1 will occur. You have a, um, a, a good leaving group and a good nucleophile and a polar, uh, polar aprotic solvent. That's going to be an SN2 reaction. But you've got a polar protic solvent and a good a leaving group but a lousy nucleophile. Well, that's going to go SN1 for a secondary carbon. So here are some examples. The first one that I look at, I see that the carbon is primary. So automatically I say, it's got to be SN2. And I see that there is a reasonable nucleophile, an excellent leaving group. What happens? SN2 re react, uh, an SN2 reaction occurs. If I look at this, what do I see? I see a secondary carbon. Now I might say, oh, wait a minute. Can, is it going to go SN1 or SN2? But not only do I see that it's secondary, but I see it's the carbocation that would result from an SN1 is going to be stabilized by the double bond that's adjacent. It's an allylic carbon. So I then look at the leaving group. It's good. I look at the uh, nucleophile. It's kind of a poor nucleophile. Well, I consider that I will have a good carbocation. I've got a reasonable leaving group, a lousy nucleophile. SN1's going to occur. So what results is from this? From the SN2 reaction, remember you always get inversion. This is a chiral 
carbon, with that chiral carbon, you're going to be having uh, an SN1 reaction. Racemization is going to be occurring. So you go ahead and try these two problems. Here's this substrate. Try to figure out what would happen, SN1 or SN2. Okay, well, I see that this is a secondary carbon, so either SN1 or SN2 can occur. If I look at these reaction conditions, I see that it's a good nucleophile and a polar aprotic solvent. So secondary carbon, good nucleophile, polar aprotic solvent, that's going to be SN2. And what do I get? I get the cyanide coming in and displacing the bromide. Notice inversion occurs because it's an SN2 reaction. What about this reaction? This reaction, I have a polar protic solvent and um, uh, not, uh, not so hot a nucleophile. It's okay. Okay, what's going to happen? You're going to get nucleophilic displacement, but what's going to happen is racemization because the secondary carbon is going to be able to undergo SN1 reaction. The polar protic solvent encourages that and that nucleophile is going to displace the bromide, but racemization occurs. Now, in Chapter two, uh, 10, excuse me, uh, we learn that a primary or a secondary alcohol can be changed to a hal halide by thionyl chloride or phosphorus tribromide, but we must use a hydrohalic acid to change a tertiary alcohol. Now, by understanding SN1 and SN2 mechanisms, we can understand the reasons for this. This is the reaction that a tertiary alcohol undergoes. We take the hydrohalic acid and we mix it with the alcohol. The hydrohalic acid protonates the alcohol. That gives us this leaving group. That's going to end up being a neutral water leaving group, so it's an excellent leaving group. I have a tertiary carbon. It leaves right here, and we get a tertiary carbon carbocation. Now, the bromide is going to dive into that naked carbocation and form the tertiary halide. So that's a reaction that we use when we have a tertiary alcohol. When we have a secondary alcohol, we use either thionyl chloride or we use phosphorus tribromide. What does this do? It reacts that each of these things, either the thionyl chloride or the phosphorus tribromide, are going to end up reacting with the alcohol. The alcohol reacts with the thionyl chloride to make a derivatized alcohol. There's a similar reaction that the phosphorus tribromide undergoes. This derivatized alcohol right here now is an excellent leaving group. The chloride then comes in and displaces the, carb, uh, the, the leaving group from the carbon by an SN2 reaction. Why does it happen this way? Well, tertiary carbons cannot react under SN2 conditions, so we can't use thionyl chloride or phosphorus prime, uh, tribromide. But they can react easily under SN1 reactions. So if we use the hydrohalic acid, it causes that carbocation to form and then a carbocation, um, the uh, halide to dive into the carbocation forming the, uh, the halogen, the, um, the halogenated alkane. Uh, one of the conditions that we notice or one of the results is that racemization occurs, but we've got to use that hydrohalic acid for a tertiary alcohol. For primary and secondary alcohols, uh, we use the thionyl chloride and the phosphorus tribromide because the primary cannot react under an SN1 condition and the secondary is slow. Also, secondary carbocations are prone to rearrangement. So if we use this in a, a secondary carbon, we're more likely to get the product that we want. So we react with the thionyl chloride, it derivatizes it, and then the chloride dives in and pushes the leaving group out of the way. It's an excellent leaving group because look what happens. We get um, sulfur dioxide, which bubbles away, 
and the chloride, which is a pretty good uh, stable ion on its own. Notice, because it's SN2, you're going to have inversion occurring.